Hello, I am Pastor Toby Philpart, moderator of the Florida East Coast Baptist Association. The Florida East Coast Baptist Association aims to effectively do ministry through evangelism, missions, and Christian education. In a short period of time, we have been able to do so. We've created nearly 100 covenant partnerships as of date, allowing us to fund over $1,100 to each of those respective areas. But we have just begun. Our goal as we approach our annual session in February is 150 partners. We can achieve this goal only with your help. So please help us make an impact in kingdom building and experience the spiritual joy of knowing what it feels like to be able to proudly say, I too am a covenant partner. My name is Melinda Collins and I am president of the Women's Department of the Northern Fellowship and I too am a covenant partner. Good day, I am Pastor Benjamin H. Parrott Sr. I am grateful to serve as the president of the Florida East Coast Missionary Baptist Association District Congress of Christian Education, and I too am a covenant partner. Hi, my name is LaWanna Parrott, department head for the youth and young adult of the Florida East Coast Missionary Baptist Association. I too am a covenant partner. Hello, I'm Pastor Howard Bebar Jr., Northern Fellowship President of the Fort East Coast Baptist Association. I'm too a covenant partner. Hello, my name is Woodrow Hay. I'm an administrative assistant for Fort East Coast. I too am a covenant partner. Hello, my name is Deacon Raymond Smith Sr. I am the president of the Layman's Men Auxiliary for the Florida East Coast Baptist Association. And I too am a covenant partner. Hello, I am Angela Shellman. I serve as chairman of the scholarship committee of the Florida East Coast Baptist Association. I too am a covenant partner. Hello, my name is Reverend T.T. Shellman Sr. I'm the first vice moderator for the Florida East Coast Baptist Association, and I too am a covenant partner. Hi, I'm Sister Gloria Jackson Davis. I'm the Woman's Auxiliary President of Florida East Coast Baptist Association, and I am a covenant partner. Hello. I'm Calvin A. Davis, Sr., Pastor of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, third Vice Moderator of the Florida East Coast Missionary Baptist Association. I, too, am a covenant partner. Hi, I am Pauline Stinson Scott, the President of the Women's Department of the Southern Fellowship. I, too, am a covenant partner. Hello, my name is Larry Lovett. I am the second vice moderator of the Florida East Coast Association. I too am a covenant partner. Hello, I'm Sanja Philpart. I am a member of the Florida East Coast Baptist Association and I too am a covenant partner. Hello, my name is Pastor Dimitri Ford. I am a vice president of the Northern Fellowship of the Florida East Coast Baptist Association and I too am a covenant partner. My name is Samilia Shellman and I represent the Florida East Coast Baptist Association as the Junior Red Circle President of the Florida General Baptist Convention, and I too one day will be a covenant partner. Good evening, our brothers and our sisters, as we have come to Tuesday night, and we have a preacher tonight in the person of my friend and my brother, Reverend Maurice Johnson. Reverend Johnson pastors the Roanoke Missionary Baptist Church in the city of West Palm Beach, Florida. And he would have us to know that he solicits our prayers as he is presently matriculating, working on his master's degree in divinity. Dr. Johnson is a friend and the brother of mine, and he is a longtime friend and brother and a member of our great association, along with the good people of Roanoke. 
The late great Reverend Dr. Arthur Jackson Jr. would often say on a night like tonight, Tuesday night is a mighty good night. You don't have to wait till Sunday morning to get to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Pastor Jackson would say so frequently somebody got saved on a Tuesday night. So brothers and sisters, come now and prepare your hearts and minds to hear this preacher from Preacherville in the person of Reverend Dr. Maurice Johnson. God bless you, Dr. Johnson. God bless you, Florida East Coast. When we come against situations in our life, we must remember to first pray yeah. and ask God to deliver us. Yeah. That's what's so important. And not only should we pray that he deliver us, but not just from circumstances and situations, but we got to narrow that thing down too because sometimes we're our own enemy. Yes. We're our own enemy. And what we need to do is ask God, Lord, even deliver me yes. from myself. Yes. Unforgiveness, whatever it is that keeps us from moving forward, Lord, deliver me.
It's all right to praise him. Lord, deliver me. He'll deliver you, I promise you. Seek the kingdom of God first. And all his righteousness will be added unto you. This is. This is my pray our God our Father we come before you this worship experience come asking that you will use us for your glory and for the good of your people speak to our hearts Lord Jesus and give us the word that will bring light to dark situations give me strength anoint me afresh now, oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And we count it as done in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a word from the Lord. Very familiar passage of Scripture, and I want to read the first five verses of Psalm 30. Psalm 30, verses 1 through 5 trust that when you would have found it, you will read along with me. Psalm 30, beginning with verse 1. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, and thou hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave, Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to, just for the next few uh, fleeting moments, I, I want to use this subject. It's coming after a while. I, I have so many wonderful memories from childhood hanging uh, on the apron strings of my grandmother, following her from place to place, from house to house, she had a knack for visiting her friends at the drop of a dime. Sometimes she would be going to see about a sick friend or relative. Sometimes she would be going just to see how her friend is getting along, just to kind of shoot the breeze and, and enjoy each other's company. There would be times when friends would be experiencing bereavement in their lives, and mother would make sure that she was there uh, just to lend a helping hand. But there's a particular time I remember better than any day that I've ever remembered before of hanging with Grandma. We had headed over to Miss Fanny's house. And in Miss Fanny's house, uh, this was not the first time I'd been there, but for some reason this day, that grandfather clock that she had that was in the corner of her living room began to fascinate me. I have fond memories of being at Miss Fanny's house. She had model cars on her coffee table, and I would be able to enjoy them by looking at them, but I couldn't touch them. But Miss Fanny's uh, 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 grandfather clock this day stood out to me like never before. I was impressed for about the first two hours of Grandma being there with Miss Fanny. And did I tell you she wasn't in a rush? In, in that space of time that we were there, and it seemed like eternity. My attention shifted from uh, 
the chiming of every passing hour to the faint clicking and clacking of the pendulum that would swing every 60 seconds. It would swing from left to right. It seemed like the longer we stayed, the louder the pendulum would get. I can almost hear it now, ticking and talking. I can hear it in my mind right now. Every minute you'd hear that tick and talk. The pendulum would just swing. This time would just go on and on and look like we were there about 18 hours. I'm not sure how long we were there, but, but I could hear that, that, that clock now like it just happened a few moments ago. Tick, tock. Every minute, tick, tock. I learned something, and what I learned that day is that every moment we live, life's pendulum keeps on moving from left to right. It swings between two extremes. It swings constantly between pain and pleasure, hope and despondency, victory and defeat, joy and sorrow. Job said it like this, man that is born of a woman has but a few days and full of trouble. In the morning, it is like the grass that grows up. That's joy. But in, when the evening comes, it cut down and withers. That's sorrow. Sometimes sorrow becomes so pervasive that, that joy seems to elude the everyday moments of our lives. And tragedy is no longer a strange and peculiar happening. We've been, for the past several months, dealing with a pandemic that we had never seen before uh, the only thing close to it happened about a hundred years before, and, and there's nobody around to tell us how they made it through. All we've got is a few reports of how they survived and what was done in order to get through that time of, of, of pain and that time of sickness and death. But, but yet, I, I need to let us understand in a hurry that, that you and I don't have any control over how the pendulum swings. Some of these things become commonplace. If I had time, I, 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 would, I would really delve deeper into this, but, but I only have so much time to talk to you. And I, I want to tell you that when, when I look at, look at, 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 at all that, that goes on in life, the only thing we have going for us is a God who's in charge of it all. Yeah. This psalm, this psalm, this psalm, the psalm that is penned here in Psalm 30 is a psalm of praise. It, it is believed that some kind of, of illness, some kind of sickness had taken hold to uh, David and, and God delivered him from the grave. He did, delivered him from a life-threatening illness. And whatever it was, it, 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 it was something that only God could handle. And, and because God was good to David, he lived to tell the story. Sometimes we miss the point that, that, that we, we, we were so quick to talk about the joy that comes that we forget the fact that God delivered David, that, that this is not the record of something David went through, somebody sitting back looking at him and writing out his biography. This is an autobiographical issue that, that, that God uh, allowed David to make it through. And instead of somebody telling David's story, he gives his own testimony. There's power in your own testimony. Too, too often we let everybody else tell our story. But, but no, this is my story. This is my song. I'm, I'm praising the Savior all the day long. I got something to shout about. And, and let me tell you better than anybody else can. I can give you my testimony when nobody else can. David here lives through that ordeal. He lives long enough to tell the story it says, I will extol thee. Now, 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 without really trying to be deep and get real down into what the word extol means, let me just tell you in a nutshell that to extol God means to give God an undiluted praise. Now, I'm not talking about some of these watered down 
expressions that are common in church. You know, the kind where you've got to be told what to do, to give God a hand of praise, say amen, lift your hand, tell God thank you. Not that kind of praise. I, I'm not talking about that. He, he, he's talking about the kind of praise when you can't wait to get outside of your car. You can't wait to get to the sanctuary where, where the shout grabs you before you get across the parking lot. The kind that, as a matter of fact, does not even have anything with, to do with you getting to church. The, the praise actually started when you got up that morning and put on your own clothes, took care of your own uh, hygiene and was able to do things for yourself, sit down at your own breakfast table and make a choice and a decision about what you wanted to eat. You had enough in your refrigerator and in your cupboard that you had a decision to make, that no decision was made for you, that all you had was a bowl of oatmeal. You ate oatmeal because you wanted oatmeal or you ate cornflakes because you wanted cornflakes. You had bacon and eggs because that's what you wanted to have. God had been so good to us that all that we needed and all that we wanted the Lord had provided those are the kinds of praise that when you start out your day you're thinking about God and his goodness and you can't wait to get to church you started shouting on the highway I'm talking about the kind of praise that, that is undiluted it's, it's the kind of praise that's not watered down so that kind of praise that, that makes you enter into his gates when we can get back into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We come in singing praises. You, you come in thankful and blessing his name. And the only reason you got is that the Lord's been good to you. And matter of fact, that's the only reason you need. When you recognize how good the Lord is and how good the Lord has been, you can't help but give him an undiluted praise. You extol him. That's the kind of praise that'll confuse enemies. You don't believe me? Ask Jehoshaphat. It, it, will, it will escort you into the realm of worship. It will escort, escort you into the spiritual realm. It will not only take you into the presence of God, it will bring God's presence down to us because God inhabits that kind of praise. He hangs around in the praises of his people. He he pitches his camp in the praises of his people. He, he wrecks his tent in the praises of his people. The psalmist says, the Lord brought me. That, that, that's, that's, that's enough to shout about right there that the Lord brought me. Verse 3, O Lord, thou hast brought me. You brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. I think one thing that, that will fuel praise is a good memory. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. A good memory will serve you well when you really want to praise God because you can't help but think of all God has done, is doing, will do. And you come to the place where you recognize that he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And David says, Lord, you brought me. Number one, you brought me up. And then after you brought me up, you brought me out. Not only did you bring me up and you brought me out, but Lord, you brought me through. Is there anybody that's ever been brought up, ever been picked up, ever been brought out, ever been brought through? Your soul looks back and wonder. You don't have to wonder how you made it. You know that the Lord was on your side. And so the, the text talks about the goodness of God. It, expresses his, his mercy, but then it goes on to talk about the grace of God. There in verse 5, for his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. The grace of God. There's, there's something about his grace. Now, 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 I got to say a little bit here 
about the grace of God, his undeserved love towards us, that unmerited favor, what he does for us that we do not deserve. And I know sometimes we think that we've lived so well and done so good that God just owes us something. But, but can I get a witness in here that everything that we have, everything that God has done for us is not based on who we are. It's all based on who he is. And because of who he is because of what he does we owe him praise because he pours out his grace even when we don't deserve it as a matter of fact if he starts to handle us with what we do deserve and starts to reward us based on our merit we would be cut off where we stand but thank God for his grace he gives us what we don't deserve but his mercy keeps what we do deserve from coming to our doorstep his grace it's, it's sufficient. Grandma used to say it's efficient. And I think she was right on both sides. It's sufficient and efficient. That, that grace is just enough. It's, it's, it's all I need when, when I can't get around anything else and, and I try to find something else that can replace it. I find nothing valuable enough that can replace the grace of God because it was his grace that looked beyond every fault and saw every one of my needs. That's why one of my favorite hymns is Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind. But now I see, but that is not my favorite verse. My favorite verse is through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Grace brought me safe thus far. His grace is what's going to lead me home. And, and I can wave my hand right there thinking about the grace of God. Because had it not been for his grace, my soul would be sinking right now. My soul would be on the way to hell. But because he stepped in right on time and right in time, he delivered my soul from hell. Then, my brothers and sisters, not only does this text talk about the goodness of God, his mercy, the grace of God, his meritless favor. When I look at this text, it also talks about the glory of God, his majesty. It speaks of his splendor, the magnificence of God, the wonder of God. In other words, it addresses the awesome power of God. You look, look, look at what it says. It says in this last portion of verse 5 that weeping may endure for a night, but joy coming in the morning. And you, you might be asking yourself, how does that really uh, display uh, the glory of God or his Majesty, How does that really talk about his power? Can I tell you how I know it talks about his power? It is the fact that only God can change your situation overnight. <laughs> Weeping endures for the night, but joy, yeah, comes in the morning. David says that the struggles of life may last all night long. But the next day, if you can just make it until the morning, all that you've been dealing with and wrestling and toiling with through the night, all of that has passed away. The problem is most of us have gotten to the place where we've lost that kind of in the morning faith. We've lost that in the morning kind of faith. That's, that's the faith that, that looks beyond the present time and is able to see a brighter day coming. It's the kind of faith that, that allows us to look in spite of our situation and see a better tomorrow coming. Jacob had that kind of in the morning faith. Because when I read Genesis chapter 32, Jacob wrestles with that angel all night long. He, he wrestles with the pre-incarnate Christ. He struggles all through the night. Can't you 
see Jacob wrestling and struggling with the Lord. But all, all through the night there, they're just going back and forth using all kinds of measures, using all kinds of holes and locks and, and wrestling techniques. They're going back and forth just wrestling all night long. And, and, and so as the day starts to break, as, as daybreak is coming, as the sun is about to peep her head over the eastern horizon, I hear, I hear the angels saying to Jacob, let me go. But Jacob said, I will not let go until he bless me. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but, but you need to have that kind of, of in the morning faith. That, that in the morning kind of faith that, that keeps you holding on until the break of day. Jacob, he wrestled with the Lord all through the night. But, but when the morning started to come, when, when day started breaking, when the new day was on the horizon, and, uh, yeah, that same angel that he's been wrestling with all night long hit Jacob in his thigh. But when he smote him in the thigh, it, it knocked his hip uh, out of joint. And, and when his hip was knocked out of joint, the Bible tells us that uh, Jacob walked differently for the rest of his life. He was limping, but he wasn't broken. He had been bruised but he wasn't knocked out of the race. Jacob waited and wrestled with the Lord until the daybreak broke. And I'm glad to tell somebody that if you learn how to hold on through the night, if you got to struggle till the midnight hour, just a hang on and a hold out. The day will come. Is there anybody here that know the Lord will show up at the break of day? So if you're going through your troubles and going through your trials and it seems like you can't make it through the night, I got only one nugget of advice for you. Just a hold on and a hang on. God will make the difference in your life if you can just hold on and hang on. Better days are coming after a while if you can just hang on and hold on. If weeping shows up at your house, don't tell weeping to leave. Invite weeping on in. But if he comes with a whole lot of luggage, tell him to leave his bags on the outside. All you can come in with is an overnight bag because you got a time frame that you can hang in my house. Your time here is only temporary. Weeping, come on in, but you can't hang but so long. I got company coming in the morning. Is there anybody in here that knows what I'm talking about? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, and I'm glad that I tried him for myself. I'm glad that I know God will show up and show out. I'm glad that I've had an experience with the Lord. I'm going to my seat. Done got happy, y'all. But those of you who are dealing in your midnights now, dealing in your nighttime situation, hold on just a little while. God will make a way for you. Is there anybody in the room? Knows what I'm talking about. Be not dismayed, whatever beside. God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you no matter what may be the test. God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will, yeah, yes he will, he'll take care of you, won't he do it, won't he do it, oh, yeah, yeah.
will, he 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 will